On June 27th of 1976, 248 people found themselves on a journey they could have never expected. Their flight may have been heading from Tel Aviv to Paris, but the passengers ended up in Entebbe, Uganda's main airport. Now, why, you ask? Well, terrorists from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine hijacked their plane and held everyone hostage in an effort to get Israel to release 53 Palestinian and pro-Palestinian prisoners. They threatened that if their demands were not met, they would kill every last hostage on board. But thankfully, IDF commandos were able to successfully rescue and save almost every person in what is today called Operation Yonatan, formerly known as Operation Antebe. Now, Israel has just marked the 43rd anniversary of this incredible mission, and I'm so excited because joining me in the studio today are Janet and Ezra Almog, two of the hostages that survived this historical event. So thank you so much for coming in today. Our pleasure. All right, so let's let's start from the beginning. How did you end up on this plane? Uh, we were flying to the States to visit my family. My family at that time lived in Madison, Wisconsin, and El Al did not fly to Chicago. So Air France offered us overnight in Paris and then to fly from Paris to Chicago, and they still owe us that overnight. We never think, made it to Paris. <laughs> I think they stole you that overnight. Yep, so you flying. obviously realized something was wrong at a given point, but when was that point? When we, we landed first in uh, Athens, and in Athens the, the bad guys got on. Uh, two of them had come from Singapore, we're told, and they got on with, uh, net, with uh, weapons. And after we took off in Athens, they began their mission. Two Palestinians from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and two Germans from the German revolutionary cells had made it onto the plane. Just a day later, they issued a declaration. The world had just three days to provide them with five million U.S. dollars and the release of 53 Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails. Or they'd start killing hostages. So the plane had already taken, taken off. off, everything seemed normal from the get-go, and then in the middle, these guys essentially stand up and start threatening people, I mean... No, they just, the two that were in the front was a man mm -hmm. and a woman, German, mm -hmm. they entered the cockpit of the plane, which in an LL plane you can't do, it's locked, but where we were, you just walk in. And they walked in and took over the plane and they got on the speaker and they said, uh, we are part of Che Guevara's revolutionary blah, 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 blah. This plane is now in our control. It's called Haifa, in honor of the cities in Israel that we will liberate, and you are under our control. This was uh, just a few minutes after takeoff. And the two young guys who were in the back with the uh, hand grenades and small guns ran down the aisles at the same time yelling something, so we would all know we were in a movie. It seems almost unbelievable. I'm imagining when you were there in that moment, what were your thoughts as, uh, as somebody who, I mean, you had obviously been in the Israeli military, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm ashamed to say, to me as an Israeli and Janet as a new uh, American immigrant, yeah. American, she spied it uh, before and uh, she said, Ezra, there are terrorists in the plane. And I said, what, what are you talking about? I didn't see any terrorists. <laughs> but there are terrorists. Then I see uh, hands are uh, <laughs> like that. And I saw these uh, Palestinians, and uh, first I believed that uh, it's a joke, it's uh, maybe a toy that he's holding. And I waited till he passed close to me, and I look at the gun. That was a real gun. <laughs> it's hard to understand, but the Israelis, the many of us uh, never had contact with the terrorists, but we heard so many events in the news, it's kind of uh, in us, like waiting for us for it to, to, happen. For, to, to, check, to change the disc and to say, okay, you heard about uh, this hijack and this event, now it's you. And you're in survivor <laughs> mode now. You're in, uh, yeah. Then we start to uh, look uh, around us uh, who is uh, another Israelis and what we can do. And uh, of course, as Israelis, we are ready to, uh, for right. action. The hijackers rerouted the plane to land in Libya for refueling so that it could make it to its final destination, the Entebbe Airport in Uganda. The hostages were taken off of the plane and moved into the airport, where they would be kept until negotiations had come to a so-called head. 
There, the hijackers were joined by four others and were supported by the forces of Uganda's president, Idi Amin. Amin had been informed of the hijacking from the very beginning and came to visit the hostages on an almost daily basis, updating them on developments and promising to negotiate to have them freed. But the hostages were by no means reassured. Just two days after landing, Ugandan soldiers began to separate the passengers on the flight, picking out Israelis and Jews and moving them into a different room from the rest of the group. Most of the non-Israelis were released. So you, you realize something's wrong and you start looking around because I'm assuming you want to see who else you could speak to about this, how there could be some type of group reaction, if any reaction at all. What was the first thing that you did? I remember thinking about my parents who were waiting for us, and when they found out about this, I was sure my father would have a heart attack yeah. and he wouldn't be there when I got there. Um, fortunately, at that time, we didn't have any kids, so it was just all or nothing kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Families grabbed their kids and tried to hide them under the seat, and uh, there was very little screaming or hysteria. People were really... I think amazingly together, mm -hmm. waiting to see what would happen. Yeah. When you're in the air and they have weapons, even, they don't mean, they, they, we were more valuable to them alive. So this was not a scene when they were going to try and start shooting in the plane. Mm -hmm. Today they would just blow up the plane. But if by accident or they did shoot and you blow out a window, end of story. So everyone was tried trying to, to stay cool, stay, right. they too, the terrorists and see what they wanted and how they were planning to get it and where we fit into all their plans. There were no air marshals no. or anything on the plane no. whatsoever. Just how many trained Israeli soldiers? And they, of course, all knew what to do. This one's going to take a Coke bottle and this one opens in. This right. one opens in. They were probably fighting already about how to, exactly. how to react. As the crisis unfolded, diplomatic attempts were being made to release the hostages on the ground. The Israeli cabinet tried to negotiate with the Ugandan president. The Egyptian government attempted to negotiate with the PLO and Uganda. And even PLO chairman sent his political aide Hani al Hassan to Uganda to try to negotiate with the hostage takers. But the hijackers refused to listen to anyone. That they separated, they moved the mothers and children forwards, supposedly to be closer to bathrooms. I don't I don't mm -hmm. know. And the rest of us back. That's all the separation that took place at that point on the plane. And um, we could feel the plane actually changing direction because this is a plane that is only capable of flying to Europe. So it's right. a long distance. It doesn't have enough ga uh, delic uh, fuel. So we didn't know where we were going to land, but we knew we had to land within a few hours. I I'd like to hear a little bit more about that kind of separation that took place down the line um, because, you know, the passengers were separated into two larger groups. And something very unique happened to the two of you as well. Maybe you can tell our viewers about that. Um, we got into Entebbe at, on Monday. On, Wednesday, on Thursday was supposed to be the first deadline, we were told. We were never told what would happen after the deadline. Just that there is a deadline uh, with the, the negotiations mm -hmm. uh, with the Israeli government. So on Wednesday, we saw, and they had taken all our passports and all our identification on the plane, just filled up bags, walked around and filled up bags. Um, as, as an Israeli, I must leave and enter Israel on an Israeli passport. As and I maintain my American citizenship, I must enter and leave the States on my American passport. Mm -hmm. So I have two passports. He has one, right. just the Israeli. Um, they had opened, reopened a, an adjoining room and they announced to us, after they had separated all the passports, we saw a pile of Israeli, a pile of American, and then the Europeans. We're going to call names, and the names we call go over to the adjoining room. And all the Israelis' antennas went boing, yeah. and they understood that this was selection time. Well, there were people there who really had been through selection time. It was very traumatic. And they started calling names. They did not separate any families, children from parents, couples, they didn't, they went, yeah. as groups, and they called him, and they didn't call me. And he said very quietly, do not volunteer your services as an Israeli, keep your mouth shut, and I'll see you in Chicago, bye. And he picked up our little overnight bag, and he went. Sitting next to me was Dora Bloch, who has a story that needs to be told too. 
she was traveling with one son to the wedding of another son, and she was sitting next to me, and I burst into tears because it was not a week to be alone. And then she was called over, and she went to him and said, she can't do it alone. She can't be there alone. You have to tell them. And he said, no, I'm not going to bring her over here. This is clearly the pressure group. It's not going to happen. She said, you have to. And he said, no. And one of the tears came over to him and uh, said, what's going on here? And he told them. And then they called me over. We don't know why. We don't know. They had two passports in my name. They did call some Americans. Mm -hmm. We'll never know why. But... Um, and you never got those passports no, back? No, no, no. For you to, to make that decision to say, hey, don't come over here with me. That's, a, that's, I can't, how did that feel? I can't even imagine. That was very, <clears throat> very difficult. Uh, when I um, passed to the other room and uh, the couple minutes I was without uh, Janet, I, I believe I, I'll never see her again. I knew that uh, where the Israelis are very dangerous, and if they want to put pressure on the Israeli government or on the French government, they will start to kill uh, hostages. What do you do? They pick you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, uh, I didn't want her to, to come, but when they called her... We sat I, and cried uh, together. Yeah. <laughs> that he doesn't want to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like crying right now hearing <laughs> that part of it because I do not know. I don't know how I would be you able to. You don't know. Yeah. That's one of the lessons yeah. I learned. You do not know who you are and how you're going to react in such a situation because you don't know what strengths you have and you don't know what weaknesses you really have until you're there. And never judge another person and say, I would have and I could have and you should have. Of course not. Yeah. Well, people do. That's, yes, that's they the do. That's the problem. Until you're there, you really don't know that part of you. The Israeli Defense Forces had finally come up with a rescue plan. Now they just needed to see if it would work. Seeing no positive end to negotiations, they decided to take matters into their own hands on the ground. An Israeli ground task military force made up of 100 commandos took off from northern Egypt, flying over the Red Sea at a height of no more than 100 feet to avoid being detected by Egyptian, Sudanese, or Saudi Arabian forces. Israeli forces landed in Entebbe late at night on July 3rd with their cargo bay doors already open. They then used a black Mercedes car and Land Rovers that had been brought along to bypass security checkpoints, since it looked like Ugandan President Amin's vehicle and security entourage. After taking down two suspecting Ugandan sentries, they ran towards the terminal and a shooting battle ensued. Three hostages were murdered in the crossfire, but every single hijacker was killed along with dozens of Ugandan soldiers. At least five Israeli commandos were wounded and unit commander Yonatan Netanyahu was killed, the brother of current-day Israeli Prime Minister. But the hostages were quickly loaded onto the IDF's aircraft and ultimately delivered to their safety. Let's talk about the rescue because I do want to get to the aftermath of this and kind of the impact that this whole event has had mm -hmm. on your lives, which I think is super, super important, um, because like you said, it showed you a lot of things about yourselves that you wouldn't have known uh -huh. otherwise, right? Uh -huh. So let's talk about that kind of moment when things started changing. Did you realize there was a chance that the IDF would be saving you? That depends who you ask. <clears throat> right. Everyone goes through it differently. Yeah. I'm a new immigrant from the States, innocent and and he's not. So I didn't think about it. It's a block you put to, to, for survival. For, right. You can't live on that kind of, for 24-7. You can't. He was You had that more. faith. It wasn't even yeah. a matter of faith. It was a matter of denial, I think, would be a better word. Mm -hmm. It's um, I think a couple minutes after we uh, got off the Air France uh, plane and we got to the terminal where we stayed, we start to look for other Israelis. To look, we were 250 passengers at the time, all the, the plane, and we look and uh, you know the Israelis can uh, recognize who is Israeli, who is not, and we start to put together to make a group of talking, and um, we were quite sure that uh, the military option will be on the table. Um, 
So everyone says what he did at the army, what experience he had. We didn't have any specialist, Israeli specialist, who know really what to do. And uh, well, but we were planning the operation for the Israeli to commander. Them, to help them. We knew that we <laughs> are very close to uh, Lake Victoria. And we knew that in the other side, uh, Kenya, that Israel is a good relation with Kenya. So we thought about commanders coming in a boat through the, uh, um, uh, crossing the, the lake. And um, the paratroopers uh, jumping into the, the lake. And, uh, but we knew about the crocodiles that uh, there was. It was a plan. <laughs> it was one of the plans. Yeah. It was one of the plans. And uh, the soldiers uh, uh, practicing, but uh, um, they jump with a boat that is in floating when it touched the water. And they, the soldier has to go into the boat. Mm -hmm. But the specialist said it's not fast <laughs> enough. The crocodile will, will get them first. before. They had, uh, so so they had, a they had plan that was yeah. well, uh, they had uh, James Bond plans, uh, um, and they were, and they were, and in the end, they went with the simplest, straightest plan to get us out. I, um, not with all the. I know they were waiting. But were you aware of any of this? No, were, you were no. not aware of any oh, of no, this. No, no, what's going in Israel? No, but uh, we, we thought that uh, it's, it's got to be some uh, operation or planning to operation, maybe. Uh, the generals will say, well, it's, it's impossible. We have to negotiate and uh, release the hostages, uh, the, the prisoners they, they want to release. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, we knew that uh, they will check uh, the uh, uh, military, military option. Uh, military, uh, option. In the end, you here were we are. rescued. <laughs> You're here today with us. You have two children that you raised. Three. Uh, three children that you raised. Um, I'd like to, to understand a little bit about how this affected your lives from that, that moment. I mean, I can, do you still think about this on a daily basis? No, no, but again, it affected me very differently than it affected him because he is who he is and he's the one who will say, meet you in Chicago, don't worry. Um, uh, if, any, if I ever hear a sudden noise, a loud noise, I jump to this day. To this day, there are things that your body absorbs, you don't even know it, in the various senses. It's not what I saw, it's not what I smelled so much, but it's what I heard. Um, I did see horrible things, but I didn't see a lot because he said to me when we're walking out, just look at my back, don't look either side, because over here there were terrorists who were killed and splattered about, okay? Right. And with that, he saved me a lot of nightmares. Had I not been with the cool, calm Israeli, I'm sure I would have come out differently. But he's willing to fly Air France today. Doesn't that say a lot? I would like to hear about the, the impact that it's had on your lives today beyond the trauma, because there are good things that come out of tragedy as well. Is that yes, fair sir. to say? Uh, tell her about boys. Yeah. Ten years after Entebbe, ten years after, we wanted to adopt a child. We couldn't get a baby in Israel. And some very dear friends on the kibbutz said, in Colombia, it's totally legal and we'll make the arrangements for you to do it. They came to visit us, some people who knew the people, and they said, your, your physical conditions of the house and everything are lovely. And they told a friend when they had come to visit that they're sorry, but we're too, we're too old there's so many people from Europe wanting to come to Colombia, they couldn't give us the baby. And on the way back, we didn't know about this, on the way back from our house within the kibbutz, we're sort of a legend in the kibbutz. Yeah. The man told this guy who had come from Colombia, by the way, they were in, on the plane in Entebbe. I don't know why, it was irrelevant. It, he, it was, there was nothing that he should have brought it up. Right. The man stopped dead in his tracks and he said, my mother was on that plane. No Only way. in Israel. Only in Israel. The, and she was with the group that uh, left before left us. Left with the, the first. She was in Israel. Really, she left. And with that, we closed the deal. And six months later, we got this magnificent baby from Colombia. We would not have gotten this child had we not been in Entebbe. And that so, is your son, Boaz, today. How old is he now? 32. 32. He's <clears throat> a very dear friend of mine as well. And you uh, have to believe there's a reason yeah. for everything in your life. You have to. Right. Because... He's the living proof of.
It's amazing. Yes, well, it is. Well, it is just, for me, such an honor to be able to sit here with you two and hear about this life changing experience. I mean, you overcame, you went through a tragedy, there was trauma, but you overcame it in such a beautiful way. You have a beautiful family. Because we family. were together. Because we were together, no question. Really? Yes, absolutely. Well, that's, that's what it's about, unity. So thank you so much for coming in. And we've Very just commemorated pleasure. the 43rd uh, anniversary of this event. So. Yeah. Amazing. We didn't talk about shooting, there's a rescue, no? <laughs> Enough? Irrelevant. Okay. He still wants to stay in the middle. I'll, I'll, don't worry, I'm going to, uh, we'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. All right, thank you, thank you so much for coming oh, in. Okay.